Hey guys, today we're going to continue our discussion of The Conscious Mind by David Chalmers. Uh, just to recap, in the last lesson, we didn't see any arguments per se. We just saw him setting the stage for his arguments. And of course, these are going to be arguments intended to prove that dualism is true as a metaphysical stance. Uh, what we talked about was this distinguishing between the psychological and the phenomenal components of mind. Uh, neither of these two things exhausted the mind. In other words, it's not like one is more correct because you need both. Uh, they're just different types of components of the mind. Remember, the psychological component is the quantitative component. Um, it's that aspect that can be measured objectively using science in its current state, right? This is like the physical components of the brain, um, how information moves across one section to another section, how different parts of the brain correspond to different behavior, um, how electricity passes through neurons and all that good stuff. But then you also have the phenomenal component of the mind, and this is the qualitative component. Uh, this is the thing that's more inner and, and subjective, which for some people is a problem, but nonetheless is something that Chalmers thinks exists, right? It's something that can't be left out of the picture of reality. And these individual instances of phenomenal experience, Chalmers called qualia, right? That's the word of the day that you guys should familiarize yourself with, is qualia. Make sure you know what qualia is, and then after today, or qualia are, sorry, it's plural, um, and make sure you understand what the arguments for qualia are. And just a note, um, I don't know if any of you may have picked up on this, but Chalmers uses this term phenomenal. Uh, he does not mean the same thing that Kant meant when he used the word phenomenal. I was thinking about this the other day, and I, I realized that maybe some of you might, might have got confused here. When Kant is talking about phenomenal, he's talking about uh, the world of appearances in general. When Chalmers used it, totally different thing. He's just referring to uh, qualia, right? So don't get, don't get caught up. Uh, that, that's why I always say it's important to define your terms because some of these people use the same words to mean different things. So that said, let's get into the stuff for today. So here are the opening questions. Um, how do we actually know that qualia exist? Right, Chalmers just kind of described these things and said, oh, you know these feelings you get and, and intuitively we want to say yes, but we haven't actually seen any definitive uh, logical proof. Right, so what arguments are there for qualia? That's the stuff we're going to talk about today, and I'm sorry that it's like raining super heavy right now, so you might hear that. But uh, let's continue. So we know that right in the beginning, Chalmers says, I will argue that consciousness escapes the net of reductive explanation. No explanation given in wholly physical terms can ever account for the emergence of consciousness. So what does that mean? What does it mean when he says that it escapes the net of reductive explanation? Well, think of the word reductive. Right, it's clearly a form of the word reduce. And you might not like this, but I think of fractions when I think of reducing, right? So you have the fraction five tenths that can be reduced to one half, right? Or you think about something like 10 twentieths, okay? That could be reduced to five tenths, can be reduced to one half. So when you reduce something, you're giving, um, like the most basic version of it, right? The simplest primary components that can account for the things, right? So what Chalmers is saying here is a lot of things that exist can be reductively explained, right? So if you were to ask someone to explain a body part, like a lung, for example, um, you could have the biologist explain a lung in biological terms, but then you can give a simpler, and by simpler I mean uh, more fundamental, to go back to Aristotle, explanation, more primary explanation of the lung by talking about the chemical or the, the chemistry explanation. And then you can give an even more basic explanation in terms of physics, right? And so at the end of the day, when you have that 
physicist explanation, whatever physical equation you have, um, the the idea of lung or the, the the lung itself is contained within that explanation. Consciousness doesn't seem to work that way, right? He doesn't think you can give this purely physicalist explanation where you explain laws of physics and energy and then, oh, consciousness is in that explanation. He thinks there's something extra, right? And it's not that he's saying currently physics can't explain this, science can't explain it in its current form. He's saying it can never account for consciousness, right? The physical explanation can never account. And that's because he's saying that consciousness just isn't physical. It's a different type of thing. Not that it is physical, but we need a better physical explanation, but that any kind of physical explanation, even if it's perfect, can never explain it because it's not the same type of thing, right? It's like, if I were to give an analogy, um, you can't use green paint to make a pink canvas. And it's not because there's not enough green, right? It's not like, oh, if only I had more green, I could make a pink canvas. It's like, no, pink and green are two fundamentally different things, so you can't use one to explain the other. Or another example would be trying to explain uh, a smell in terms of a sound. Like, they're just different types of things, right? You can't it's not like, oh, if only I had more sound, I could explain what the smell is like. So they're different types. And that's even less difficult than the consciousness explanation because at least sound and smell um, have these shared physical underlying uh, conditions. But consciousness is even more difficult, right? It's even more not a type than these other types. So he gives these five arguments in the chapter in favor, or rather, that, that are supposed to prove the existence of qualia. We're just going to outline three. I think these are the three strongest and the three most important, and the three that are easiest to understand, that give you a feel for everything. So this first argument is called the logical possibility of zombies. Now, this sounds weird, um, but it's not as weird as it sounds, I promise. So let's go through this and then we'll take it step by step. So if you look on 94, Chalmers says, the most obvious way, although not the only way, to investigate the logical supervenience of consciousness is to consider the logical possibility of a zombie. Someone or something physically identical to me, or any other conscious being, but lacking conscious experience altogether. So the way he's going to argue is in terms of conceivability. Conceivability is how imaginable something is. And not even how imaginable it is, but if it can be imagined. And his point is that we can prove that certain positions are true or false merely based on whether or not something's logically coherent. So, for example, like 2 plus 2 is 4, right? Um, if someone made the claim 2 plus 2 is 5 using the same definitions of 2 and addition as equals, like that's not even conceivable, right? You can't con even conceive that 2 plus 2 is 5, therefore you know it's false, right? Because definitionally it, do it doesn't make sense. It's not a matter of, a matter of like, hmm, I can't imagine um, people having different beliefs than me. That's not true. You could. You could, right? This is you literally can't imagine things. It's like if... A equals B, and if B equals C, then it would have to follow that A equals C, right? Necessarily, because it's deductive. You can't say A equals B, B equals C, but then A doesn't equal C. Like, you can't even imagine that that's true because it involves a, a, a true contradiction. So that's this is Chalmers' point. He's going to like take a look at what the physicalist argument is, right? The, the position that says consciousness is physical and then try and um, analyze the logic to prove it wrong by showing that something can or cannot be conceived uh, in, in the way that I've just explained. So to continue, he says, so let us consider my zombie twin. This creature is molecule for molecule identical to me but he lacks conscious experience entirely. 
To fix ideas, we can imagine that right now I am gazing out the window, experiencing some nice green sensations from seeing the trees outside. Right now it's seeing rain outside. Uh, having pleasant taste experiences through munching on a chocolate bar and feeling a dull aching sensation in my right shoulder. Okay, so that's what you're thinking. Imagine you're doing this thing right now. It says, okay, so what is going on in my zombie twin? He is physically identical to me, and we may as well suppose that he is embedded in an identical environment. He will certainly be identical to me functionally. He will be processing the same sort of information, reacting in a similar way to inputs uh, with this, in, sorry, with his internal configuration being modified appropriately and with indistinguishable behavior resulting. He will be psychologically identical to me in the sense developed in chapter one. That's the psychological mind. He will be perceiving the trees outside in the functional sense and tasting the chocolate in the psychological sense. And all of this follows logically from the fact that he is physically identical to me by virtue of the functional analyses of psychological notions. He will even be conscious in the functional sense as described earlier. He will be awake, able to report the contents of his internal states, able to focus attention in various places, and so on. It is just that none of this functioning will be accompanied by any real conscious experience. There will be no phenomenal feel. There is nothing it is like to be a zombie. So let's let's start over. Okay. Clearly, you could tell, and if you can't, we're gonna we're gonna explain why, that he's not talking about a zombie like in the regular usage of the word. Like he's not talking about Night of the Living Dead people eat your brains like 28 days later. He's not talking about that. He's just using this word in a different way. Chalmers zombie is not this Hollywood eat your brain zombie. He just means like something that's physically identical to you, but lacks conscious experience entirely. So it's a phenomenal zombie, right? It has all the psychological underpinnings of consciousness, but it doesn't have qualia, right? That's what he means by zombie. So he says, this, this quote-unquote zombie is molecule for molecule identical to me, right? So you have you, and you have this twin of you, and this twin is physically identical to you, but it doesn't have conscious experience. It doesn't have qualia. So imagine two things, two people, or people-like things, and there's no physical difference between these two things. The only difference is that one has conscious experience and one doesn't. And to hammer the idea down, he gives examples. Like, imagining you're looking at green sensations. You're eating chocolate. You're feeling pain. Since you are conscious, you're going to have the, psycho uh, the psychological causes of those things, but also the qualitative components. So, like, when you're looking at the tree, um, it feels like something, to go back to what we said uh, the other day, to look at the green tree. Right? Like there's a feeling of seeing green. And although those visual receptors shooting to your brain describe some of it, it, that's not all of it, right? Or when you eat chocolate, it's not just that your receptors are firing. It's that there's a feeling of, of what chocolate tastes like and what pain feels like. So that's you, right? Looking outside of the trees, eating chocolate, having pain in your shoulder. But the zombie, what's going on over here? Well, since the zombie is physically identical to you, this means that it's going to be functionally identical to you. And remember, function is, is like behavior. Remember, Skinner talked about this. Meaning, the, be the zombie is also staring out the window, looking at a green tree, um, eating a chocolate bar, and having some kind of inflammation, like in its shoulder or whatever he said. Um, it's psychologically identical to you. So when the zombie looks out the window and sees green, the light is interacting with the rods and cones in his eyes and causing some electrical impulses to go to his brain. Um, similarly, when it eats the chocolate bar, same thing. The signals are getting sent to the brain. And oh, the inflammation is sending signals to his brain, right? So physically, you guys are identical. Um, but this thing doesn't feel those things, uh, the, the, the qualia caused by the physical properties. It just has the physical properties, right? There's no phenomenal component since there's no consciousness. There is nothing it is like to be a zombie. That's the fundamental difference. 
think of a, think of the zombie like a computer, right? Imagine that you design some kind of Android computer thing that functions like a human and the Android computer thing is looking out the window, eating a piece of chocolate and, and having some kind of inflammation in its shoulder, right? Like you guys are physically identical, but the computer doesn't feel it. It's like how we said, um, when you listen to music, it's not the same thing as when a microphone picks up sound because the microphone isn't like feeling the music. It's just manipulating variables in a certain way uh, physically. Same thing with your zombie. But this is the argument, right? The, the, Chalmers' point is this. He says, if physicalism is true, and remember, physicalism is the belief that everything is physical, right? But he's arguing against this. He says, if physicalism is true, then consciousness would supervene on the psychological properties, which are the physical properties. And supervenience is a weird word. It means like the, all of the facts about consciousness would always already be contained in the physical properties. That's what it would mean for consciousness to supervene on them. Um, it's a little more complex than that, but that's, that's all we need. So if physicalism was true, consciousness would supervene on, on the physical psychological properties. And if consciousness supervened on the psychological properties, then we wouldn't be able to imagine two things that were psychologically identical but phenomenally different. This is important. So if consciousness supervened on the physical, this would mean that if there were two physically identical things, they would have to be phenomenally identical, right? Because remember, physicalists say that the phenomenal components are already contained within the physical. They're not something extra. So that means we wouldn't be able to imagine, oh yeah, they're identical physically, but not phenomenally, right? But we can imagine two things that are psychologically and physically identical, but phenomenally different. You and the zombie twin. Therefore, physicalism's false because consciousness does not supervene on the physical. Therefore, some form of dualism is true. That's Chalmers' argument. And I put a little image here uh, to give you an idea of what's happening. The one on the left is you. The one on the right is the zombie twin, right? Physically identical, but there's no uh, qualia happening. So that one is tough. Um, before I move on, I want to say you could find this everywhere. Um, if you want to learn more about the, the phenomenal zombie argument, Google Chalmers zombie argument. There's like videos on this. There's articles written about this that I think might help you if you're still having trouble. So keep that stuff in mind. That said, let's move on to a second argument. Similar, similar. Um, it gets the idea of the zombie one across, but in a way that is, is maybe much more easy to understand. This one's called the inverted spectrum argument. And he talks about this on 99. He says, even in making a conceivability argument against logical supervenience, it is not strictly necessary to establish the logical possibility of zombies or a zombie world. So we don't even need to think about the zombie thing to prove physicalism false, right? To prove his point. He says instead that it suffices to establish the logical possibility of a world physically identical to ours in which the facts about conscious experience are merely different from the facts in the world without conscious experience being entirely absent. So he's saying with the zombie example, well, we'll get to this in a second, let me finish. As long as some positive fact about experience in our world does not hold in a physically identical world, then consciousness does not logically supervene. Okay, so with this zombie argument, he was saying, imagine that two things are physically identical, but one has conscious experience and one doesn't, right? So there's the presence of consciousness and then the absence of consciousness. But he's saying you don't even need to do that. You could imagine two things that are physically identical and they both have consciousness, but the facts about consciousness are different. So it's not a matter of having qualia or having consciousness and then not. It's like you, you both have qualia, but are experiencing the qualia differently. He's saying if that is conceivable, then physicalism is false because that too would show that there's no supervenience. How is that possible though, right? He says on page 100, it is therefore enough to note that one can coherently imagine a physically identical world in which conscious experiences are inverted 
Or at the local level, imagine a being physically identical to me, but with inverted conscious experiences. One might imagine, for example, that where I have a red experience, my inverted twin has a blue experience and vice versa. Of course, he will call his blue experiences red, but that's irrelevant. What matters is that the experience he has of the things we both call red, blood, fire engines, and so on, is of the same kind of experiences I have of the things we both call blue, such as the sea and the sky. It seems entirely coherent that experiences could be inverted while physical structure is duplicated exactly. Nothing in the neurophysiology dictates that one sort of processing should be accompanied by red experiences rather than by yellow experiences. Okay, so he says, don't even imagine something that's physically identical to you but lacking consciousness. He says, imagine something that's identical to you but has consciousness, but they're just experiencing things differently. Ima and he picks color as an easy example. So imagine that you and someone else you both see color, but your color experiences are inverted. So when you look at, I don't know, pick an apple or something. You could pick any object, but let's pick an apple. And then you look at the apple, and then it looks one way, and then you say, oh, it's red. But someone else looks at the apple, and they see a different thing, but they still call it red. He says, can you imagine that? And this is something that you guys probably thought about before. Like, I think um, children often engage in this thought experiment indirectly. They say, like, oh, you know, how do I know that when I look at the grass and I say I see green and you look at the grass and you say that you see green, how do we know we're seeing the same thing? Right? Because all you know is that you're using the same word. All you know is that your words just happen to match up perfectly. You could imagine that you're actually having different color experiences, right? That your spectrum is inverted, but that the labeling just lines up nicely. He says, this is perfectly conceivable. So how does this prove his argument? Very similar. He says, if physicalism is true, then consciousness would supervene on the psychological physical properties, right? Same as in the zombie argument. And he said, if consciousness supervened on psychological properties, then we wouldn't be able to imagine two things that were psychologically identical, but phenomenally different. Again, very similar. However, we can imagine two things that are psychologically identical, but phenomenally different. You and the person that has the inverted color experiences. Therefore, physicalism is false. And therefore, some kind of dualism is true. So this one's tricky, but think about it. Let's say there was you and there was someone who had the exact same physical anatomy as you, right? Molecule for molecule identical. They have the same eye anatomy. Um, and then in addition to that, you guys are looking at the same object, again, an apple or something. Let's say you're at the same kind of angle. So lights bouncing off of it into your eyes in the same way, right? So physically, there's no difference between the two situations. He said, if physicalism was true, then the sheer fact that the physical situations were identical would logically prove automatically that you were having the same qualia. You wouldn't be able to imagine like, oh, well, there's the same physical situation, but we're actually experiencing color differently. But you can imagine that which means that the phenomenal qualities aren't already contained in the physical qualities. Because if they are, you couldn't imagine identical physical properties, but different phenomenal qualities. And so the image there kind of helps. Remember the last one had someone with a color bubble, and then the other one was empty? This one doesn't. This one, uh, they both have color bubbles, and they're different colors, but they're both saying blue. That kind of gets the idea across. Here's another image that helps, right? People are both looking at the same thing, but they're getting different qualitative experiences and just using the same words. So imagine like this was happening when you and your friend looked at a strawberry, right? Imagine the person on the left is you, the person on the right is your friend. And when you look at the strawberry, you see what's in that left thought bubble. But then when your friend looks at the strawberry, uh, she sees what's in the right thought bubble. Clearly different, right? but you, you both say red. 
So similarly, like when, when you look at blood, you say red. When your friend looks at blood, they still see that color, which to you is green, but to them is red. Or when you look at, um, what's another, like a fire engine, he said, you see what you see on the left, but your friend sees the fire engine and the color on the right, and you both just happen to see red. He says, you can imagine that. Therefore, there must be something about consciousness that goes beyond the mere physical facts of the situation. Again, this one, um, you could also find a lot of information about. Now, here's argument number four. We skipped over three, and we're not going to do five, because I think they're less captivating, maybe more difficult, less interesting. Number four is probably the most famous one, because it's not actually Chalmers' argument. It, uh, it's made by this guy named Frank Jackson uh, in the 70s, I believe. Um, and it's called the knowledge argument. And maybe you guys have even heard of this before, so let's go through it and then, and then dissect it. So in 103, he says, Imagine that we are living in an age of a completed neuroscience where we know everything there is to know about the physical processes within our brain responsible for the generation of our behavior. Mary has been brought up in a black and white room and has never seen any colors except for black, white, and shades of gray. She is nevertheless one of the world's leading neuroscientists specializing in the neurophysiology of color vision. She knows everything there is to know about the neural processes involved in visual information processing, about the physics of optical processes, and about the physical makeup of objects in the environment. But she does not know what it is like to see red. No amount of reasoning from the physical facts alone will give her this knowledge. It follows from the facts about the subjective experience of color vision are not entailed by the physical facts. If they were, then Mary could, in principle, come to know what it is like to see red merely on the basis of her knowledge of the physical facts, but she cannot. Okay, so this is a thought experiment, which, which were often useful when we're trying to, to figure out what is uh, logically conceivable and possible. So he says, imagine there's this girl named Mary. And Mary is like the world's leading neuroscientist. And she specializes in the neurophysiology of color. So all she studies is like what wavelengths color are and how the light bounces off objects physically and how the light interacts with the rods and the cones in your eye and how the signals are sent. Like she knows all of that. Right? She has perfect physical explanation of color experience. But she has only been in a black and white room for her entire life. She's never seen color. Everything in the room is black and white. There's no mirrors. Anything she could see about herself is black and white, right? There's just, there's just no actual color in her world. The question is, what if one day Mary stepped outside the black and white room for the first time ever and saw like a rose, right? Saw a red flower. The question is, did Mary learn something new when she saw the red flower? Because if you say, yes, Mary gained some new knowledge when she sees the red flower that she didn't have when she just understood all the physical facts about red, then you are admitting that there's something in the direct experience of a color that's not already contained in the physical information about the color, right? That's the idea. No amount of reasoning from the physical facts could have given her that experience of red. So this is the argument broken down. So if physicalism was true, then knowledge of all physical facts about X would necessarily entail knowledge of all phenomenal facts about X. And X could be anything, right? It's just a variable. But we can totally imagine a situation where having all the physical facts about color vision, for example, does not contain all the phenomenal facts about color vision. Mary, right? Understanding everything about red and how it's processed by the brain, but not actually knowing what it is like to see red, not having the qualia of red. Therefore, physicalism is false, because if it was true, we wouldn't be able to imagine this. Therefore, some form of dualism is true. And the image on the right may help you a little bit, right? Um, red to her is just an equation. 
It's just a series of processes. But that information did not give her what she gained when she actually looked at a red thing. Like there's some gap. And for Chalmers, this means, and for Jackson, who made the argument, this means that Mary gained something, which means physicalism must be false because there must be some type of knowledge that's non physical, i.e., qualitative. Here's a cool video um, that you guys might want to check out that goes into more detail about the knowledge argument. It gives you some cool visuals. Um, it explains it in multiple ways. It explains how Jackson went back and forth on his position. It explains different responses that people have to the knowledge argument. So I would definitely, definitely recommend checking this out. Um, as I was mentioning before, you guys may have heard of the knowledge argument because of pop culture. Like I know in that movie that came out a few years ago, uh, what's it called? Ex Machina, about uh, where Scarlett Johansson was uh, an android. Uh, the guy and her had this conversation and like they brought up Mary's room. So that was a bad explanation that happened in the movie. Um, like it's cool that they referred to some issue happening within like academic philosophy, but it wasn't represented correctly or entirely correctly. Um, this is the actual presentation of it. So please check out this video. I think that it'll help. It's not that long. And so here's the recap of, of today. So Chalmers provided three arguments for why consciousness cannot be explained by purely physical explanation. That's the claim. And each of these little arguments were supposed to be premises that support this conclusion. Um, and again, remember, the lack of explanation is not just because we don't have enough physical information. right? It's not like Chalmers is saying, oh, if only we had more physical facts, then we could explain consciousness. No, he's saying that you could have all the physical facts in the world and it still wouldn't give you consciousness. Consciousness would still be a surprise to go back to the, the lesson from the other day because consciousness is not the same type of thing as physical things in the same way that you could have all the facts about hearing and that wouldn't give you facts about smell. Or here's, here's an easy one. Let's say you encountered a person who was blind from birth and never experienced color. Like Chalmers' point is no amount of physical facts about color would ever actually give that person the experience of color. Or if someone doesn't have the sense of smell, like you can't just give physical explanations of smell and then hope that, oh, the qualia is going to pop into their head. And for Chalmers, this is because although the physical stuff maybe gives us qualia, right? Maybe qualia emerges from the physical processes. They're not the same thing. That is his point. And so here are the questions you want to consider at the end of this is, is Chalmers right? Do qualia exist in the way he describes? Are there these ineffable, um, non-physical things going on in reality by means of consciousness that, that can't be explained by physics, that can't be explained by science in its current form? Or, or is it wrong? And if we think it's wrong, why do we think it's wrong? Like, are there any good ways to object to his dualist arguments? Of course there are. And I wonder if you guys are going to be able to think of anything on your own because Chalmers is responding to Dennett's 1991 book, uh, Consciousness Explained. This, this book came out in like 96 or 97, but it, that was like over 20 years ago. So th this argument is still happening. There's no clean resolve. And for next class, we're going to see Dennett again responding to Chalmers. Right. So we started with Dennett. We saw Chalmers' response to Dennett, and then now we're going to see Dennett's response to Chalmers. So we'll get like a nice conversation going on. All right, so start thinking about these things for next time. Uh, we could stop there. As always, contact me through email if you guys have any questions. I'll see you around.